tonight, the shocking end to a months-long political drama. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney steps down. I have informed the president of the party of my intention to step down as leader. Reaction to the surprising move and what comes next? Canadians grapple with sky-high inflation. I've never seen anything like it in my life. We're having a real tough time. Will it ever come down? And what can you do? Warnings as outbreaks of a rare disease hit Europe, the US and Canada. This once again highlights um, the threat of viruses like this. What is monkeypox and what you need to know about it? And as more countries decide to cut ties with the monarchy, we ask, how hard would that be to do here? In the Canadian context, it's actually quite difficult. This is The National. We begin with breaking news tonight. After months of political drama and bitter division within Alberta's governing party, Premier Jason Kenney says he is stepping down. Now, the shocking announcement came moments after he narrowly won a hotly contested referendum on his leadership. While 51% of the vote passes the constitutional threshold of a majority, it clearly is not adequate support to continue on as leader. And that is why tonight, I have informed the president of the party of my intention to step down as leader of the United Conservative Party. Now, Kenny had said all he needed to stay on was 50% of the vote plus one. 51.4% of United Conservative Party voters said they approved of his leadership. But tonight, again, Kenny said that was not enough. So this is a stunning turn of events after a months-long political saga that has gripped and divided Albertans. Here's Carolyn Dunn on the drama of the day and how we got here. After months of political infighting, Jason Kenney says his victory was too narrow for political survival. And so he bowed out of his job as leader of the party. I truly believe that we need to move forward united. We need to put the past behind us. And our members, a large number of our members, have asked for an opportunity to clear the air through a leadership election. The clock is ticking. A general election is set for next year. Kenny's support plummeted during the COVID crisis from both sides, those who said he was too lax and those who said he was too restrictive. But his most vocal critics within the party say it's not really about policy. It's a failure in leadership. It's making bad decisions over a period of time uh, and not involving the rest of the people that should be involved. Our belief is that the province is not behind him, that he is not electable, and that the only way for UCP to beat the NDP next year is with a new leader. And in Kenny's own riding, mixed feelings. I think he's done a great job. I think Alberta's sitting sitting fairly well compared to the rest of the provinces around Canada. He hasn't done anything for us. It's all about him. It's all about him. Majority, he was voted and he won the election. So... Uh, let him finish his term first. But with such a low percentage tonight, just 51.4% of 34,000 voters in favour of his leadership, Kenny clearly didn't think that he could credibly lead the party into the next election. So the party is going to have to pick its next leader and regroup well in advance of Albertans going to the polls next May. Adrian? All right, a huge night in Alberta. Carolyn, thank you. So let's bring in the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, on this unfolding, breaking story. Vashi, uh, as it's sinking in, what do you make of this news? Hey, Adrian. Look, I think, I think the audience saw my reaction by accident. My, my jaw actually physically dropped. I think that based on the results, as Carolyn was mentioning, it's not a massive surprise that this ultimately ended up happening. But if you are familiar with Jason Kenney and his style of politics and the way in which he telegraphed he would be acting, even if he got just 50.1% or 51% in this case, you would be shocked by the decision he made tonight. He was in it for a fight. He conveyed that in the lead up to this. He did not give any indication that if it was 51 or 55, he would be stepping back. Uh, and so I think tonight is hugely significant. Uh, it really changes the dynamic for conservatism in Alberta going forward. And personally for Jason Kenney, a figure many Canadians would have been familiar with on the federal scene, this is certainly the greatest political failure of his political life. And how he wears that going forward, I think, will certainly be something to watch. 
So Carolyn touched on it a moment ago with, you know, Kenny's desire for a quick process. But what happens next? What happens next, uh, very sort of imminently tomorrow, is that caucus meets. And caucus is where a lot of the dissent began and, and clearly now where it ended. How, what emerges from that? Who becomes the interim leader, for example, is something I'm paying attention to. That will help us understand what the party looks like going forward and what direction it takes post Jason Kenney. Uh, beyond that, then you look for the leadership election. And as Carolyn mentioned, that could be a drawn out process. Not sure how long that takes. There's an election next year, though, so they probably don't want to wait too long. All right. Thank you, Vashi. Vashi Capello is host of Power and Politics on CBC News Network. Well, it's no secret to anyone who buys just about anything that prices are still on the rise in this country. Just getting by is getting a lot harder for lots of people. So tonight, we can attach a few new numbers to that pain, starting with 31. Inflation hitting another 31-year high. The rate itself sitting at 6.8%, the highest it's been since 91. Driving the climb. Basic necessities, food up 9.7% over last year, and shelter up over 7%. As Allison Northcott shows us, that is squeezing budgets and pushing some people to the brink. As Canada's inflation rate rises, this food bank is seeing demand decline. In April, per week, we were seeing over 1,300 people um, per week, which was the highest on record for us. Friends Holly Loic and Carlisle Lambert say they can no longer afford to buy all the groceries they need. Can't even get by with rent and the food costs, right? And when they raise all the prices, you're left to go to food banks. Some food prices are seeing double-digit increases. Fresh fruit and meat up 10% over last year. Bread, 12. Pasta, nearly 20. You know, you have to eventually buy less of the things that you want because things are more expensive now. Statistics Canada says Russia's invasion of Ukraine, poor weather in growing regions and costs of fertilizer and natural gas have all made groceries more expensive. Shelter and gas prices also spiking while wages lag behind. Prince Edward Island has the highest inflation rate of any province. I'm on a fixed income and we only have my wife working. I wouldn't say we're really broke but we're teetering on it. We're, we're having a real tough time. It just keeps going higher and higher. It's giving us a, a tougher time to be able to buy, afford more groceries than we, we normally did a couple of months ago. Feels like, I think, to most Canadians that inflation is just inescapable at this point. This economist says while the Bank of Canada can't control global factors like supply chain problems, energy costs and war, it can raise interest rates to try to slow borrowing and cool things domestically. Shelter inflation is coming uh, primarily from higher house prices. And if the Bank of Canada can cool some of that, it's going to help to uh, cool overall inflation. He says in raising rates, the bank needs to be slow and steady to avoid a recession. Economists say expect another rate hike next month. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, so let's bring in personal finance expert Rubina Ahmed Hack into this conversation. And boy, inescapable, that's not a word I think most folks want to hear at this point. Is this our new normal, Rubina? You know, why is inflation continuing to rise? So interest rate is a piece of it. Supply chain issues is another piece. Uh, the fact that demand is up so much with the pandemic and the restrictions being lifted, all that is raising prices. Um, and even if interest rates are higher, it takes about a year for that actually to be reflected in consumer goods. So it's going to be a while before we see prices actually come down. And then, of course, this, this squeeze happens because the wages aren't increasing fast enough to keep pace. So, so how should people be coping right now? So if you are interested in making more money, the best advice I could give is to look for a new job. The best way to get a wage bump is to actually start a new job at a new company. You can also speak to your employer and see if they can increase your salary, uh, but it's not going to increase by seven, eight, nine percent, which is where inflation is headed towards. And that is something that, you know, for families is going to be very difficult as to what they have to cut in order to make their budget work. Can we also get your take on, on something else that happened today? You know, huge dive, right, on the markets. Uh, the Dow Jones falling 3.6%, worst day since June 2020, driven, you know, experts say, by inflation fears of, of major retailers. What are we to make of all of this happening at the same time? And is this a sign of, of bad things to come? 
So throughout the pandemic, we've been hearing that uh, a lot of Canadians and Americans have all this pent up savings that they're going to unleash into the economy once they're able to do so. But with inflation ticking higher, many of those same families that have been saving the money may decide to keep it in their bank account, may decide to invest it and see what happens with inflation. So that is why companies like Walmart and Target are cutting their outlook. And that is sending fear, saying that, well, that economic boom that we were looking forward to may never come because Canadians may just hang on to the money that's in their bank account and not spend it on consumable items, which is so important when it comes to uh, the Canadian economy and the American economy. All right, Rubina, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. A rare outbreak of monkeypox in Europe seems to have spread to Canada. Health officials in Montreal are investigating several suspected cases described as a mild or smallpox. It's typically found in Africa, transmitted through infected animals. But as Lauren Pelly shows us, there are questions about how it's spreading now. Public health teams in Quebec are now investigating 13 cases of suspected monkeypox. They're very specific. They look like... Uh, mini volcanoes, this is how I describe them. This Montreal time. physician uh, treated several patients with the condition's telltale lesions. People who do have the infection and who have had the contact with the person who is diagnosed or had symptoms should isolate themselves. The U.S. also confirmed its first case today, a Boston man who recently traveled to Canada. An outbreak in Europe has grown to more than 30 confirmed or suspected infections. The World Health Organization says the disease can turn deadly and there's no specific treatment. This once again highlights um, the threat of viruses like this. Symptoms of monkeypox can include fever, headaches, swollen lymph nodes, chills and exhaustion, along with those lesions. These latest cases appear to be spreading through close human-to-human -human contact. I mean, it's either that it's a more transmissible variant of monkeypox than any that we've seen before uh, between humans, or there are behaviors that are associated um, with increased transmission. Medical experts say cases are appearing among gay and bisexual men. It doesn't necessarily mean it's sexually transmitted. It just means that it's amplified among people who are in close proximity to each other. Anyone can spread this virus through open sores, contact with bodily fluids, or by touching contaminated clothes or bedding. Still, there's concern about targeting the LGBTQ community with public health warnings. I don't think the disease is going to be serious enough or have serious consequences to put more stigma on the community. I hope not. The official declaration of the end of smallpox. The vaccine that eradicated smallpox does work against monkeypox as well. But routine smallpox vaccination in Canada stopped by the 1970s. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Russia has announced it is forcing the closure of the CBC News Bureau in Moscow, calling it retaliation for Canada's ban on a Russian news channel. It is the first time a foreign government has ordered a CBC Bureau to pack up and go. Ashley Burke has the reaction. For months now, Russia's been cracking down on journalism and dissent in the country. Now it's abruptly kicking CBC News out altogether. It's a sad day. I mean, we are all deeply, deeply disappointed. Since the Russian invasion, Moscow passed laws to silence foreign media, threatening to jail reporters up to 15 years for even describing this conflict in Ukraine as a war. CBC. Today, Russia called CBC a propaganda mouthpiece and said it's stripping staff of visas and accreditation. We are just making a retaliatory step. Two months ago, Canada's broadcast regulator banned this Russian state-controlled TV channel from Canadian airwaves. Russia says CBC could be allowed back if that ban ends. Canada uh, understands that it's not right to close uh, Russian TV stations. So uh, when Canada stop uh, using censorship in media. So. CBC News and its journalists are completely and entirely independent of any government or agency. So we don't have anything to do with those decisions. 44 years of continuous reporting from Russia now ends. The Bureau documented pivotal moments in history. The Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union, political upheaval. 
but now CBC News forced out because of the war in Ukraine. It's unfortunate but not surprising that he's trying to shut down strong journalistic institutions. It is clear that Putin and his enablers cannot imagine a world in where the press is free and doesn't take its marching orders from the government. The editor-in-chief of CBC News says that it will continue to cover Russia as best as it can, but that it will be more difficult. Russia says staff have three weeks to close the bureau and to cease operations. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Briar Stewart is one of the CBC journalists being kicked out of Russia. Earlier, I spoke with her from Kyiv. So, Briar, what's your sense? Why is this happening right now? Well, this is just really the latest attempt by Russia to try to quash any kind of independent journalism uh, about their country. Like, even before I arrived in Moscow, which was just at the end of August, you already had so many Russian journalists that are independent being labeled foreign agents. You had some foreign journalists that were being expelled. But things became substantially worse after February 24th when Russia invaded Ukraine. The government brought in new laws, fake news laws, discrediting the military. And, you know, there was a very strong signal that they did not want journalists to operate there and certainly not independently. But still, this came as a shock today. So Canadians have really relied on the CBC in Moscow for decades. And I'm curious, picking up on what you just said, can you characterize how the capacity to report has changed? It's become substantially harder, and part of that just has to do with how the government there, you know, brands journalists. Like, even when we were trying to do stories that were sort of positive, like we wanted to do a story on a group that was delivering firewood to people who didn't have gas to heat their homes. And uh, they were interested at first until they found out we were Canadian, and they said, no, we don't, we don't want to be associated with any kind of work that you do. After the invasion, we wanted to do a story on sanctions, and Botox clinics are very popular in Russia. There was a run on Botox clinics because the product wasn't going to come in as it was before and at first they agreed same thing happened they called back the next day and said actually you're from an unfriendly country so we can't talk to you so you know when you're facing that kind of resistance in those kind of situations you have to appreciate just how difficult it is to talk to people about truly sensitive matters like you know number of military deaths one last thought what happens next for you and especially the local russian staff well, the local staff, our Russian staff, is really, you know, the priority right now because uh, they cannot work for us in Russia anymore. Um, but as far as CBC's coverage goes, as far as what we'll be doing, uh, myself and my producer, Corinne Semenov, we're going to keep covering Russia. Uh, it's going to be a challenge because we can't be there, but we're, it's very important to keep covering it now, now more than ever, and we're just going to have to do it outside its borders. All right, Briar, thank you very much to you and the whole team there, okay? You're welcome. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky moved to extend emergency powers another 90 days. While in the capital, the first captured Russian soldier to stand trial for war crimes entered his plea. A 21-year-old Russian soldier has pleaded guilty in the first war crimes trial of this conflict. He admitted to fatally shooting a 62-year-old civilian in the head in the early days of the war. The victim's widow, who attended the trial, later said she felt sorry for the young man, but said she could not forgive him. And in Mariupol, the Russians have prisoners of their own. They released this video of Ukrainian fighters who surrendered from the besieged Azovstal steelworks. Now, that battle may be over, but the aftermath is hard to fathom. Ukrainian drone footage shows the once picturesque city before the battle, and now, in Russian hands, a hollowed-out shell. The next big fear, says the city's mayor, disease. With no clean water and no electricity, he says cholera and dysentery could kill thousands. Now, the war in Ukraine featured prominently on the second day of the royal visit to Canada. In Ottawa today, Prince Charles and Camilla made a stop at a Ukrainian cathedral, a show of support for the community. David Cochran shows us what else they got up to. The day started by remembering the great conflicts of the past with a lament and a wreath laying at the National War Memorial. But as the day unfolded, it focused on the great conflict of the moment. Notably, a visit to a Ukrainian cathedral where the royal couple took part in a traditional prayer service, a clear expression of solidarity. And thanks for your desire and finding time to visit 
us during the war waged by Russian Federation against our ancestral homeland, Ukraine. The prince and the duchess were given the traditional Ukrainian greeting of bread and salt. Camilla took some time to decorate Ukrainian eggs as the royal couple spent more than their allotted time to meet with members of the Ukrainian community. And no trip to Ottawa is complete without a stop at the Byward Market. They've got to try the beaver tail. It's a staple. <laughs> and so they did, or at least they looked at some beaver tails. If they ate them, it wasn't on camera. It was so wonderful. <laughs> The public events were a curated series of pageantry, outreach, Instead of seats. and photo ops, it's going to be ending with a private reception at Rideau Hall to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. We don't know what was discussed in the reception, but we do know that Métis National Council President Cassidy Curran said she was going to speak with the Prince and ask for an apology and reparations from the Queen for the Church of England's role in residential schools. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the royal visit is raising questions about this country's relationship with the monarchy. One person is born with privileges. I mean, I found this idea repulsive. So we'll explore Canada's deep ties with the crown, the calls to cut them, and if it's even possible. The illnesses that are hurting BC's oyster farms and what can be done to prevent them. So we start talking about leaky septic systems and stuff like that. Who's going to go check somebody's system? And a face full of face paint is on the line. The big bet between Alberta's big city mayors as the Oilers and the Flames meet in the playoffs. Bring it on. We're back in two. A disturbing rise in brutal teen violence has BC police forces searching for reasons why. Renee Filipponi shows us some disturbing scenes and what experts say is behind them. <laughs> Swarmed by her peers and left bloodied and bruised, a 15 year old Surrey girl was forced to kiss her attacker's shoes. The incident from earlier this month was filmed and then shared on social media. It was disgusting um, seeing not only just my daughter being physically hurt, um, but the humiliation and the degrading they did to her after that. The victim's mother, whose identity we are withholding to protect her daughter, says the physical wounds are healing, but her daughter is struggling mentally. Like what was going through their head? Like what makes you think that this is okay to do this to anybody? These all um, look, feel, like real weapons. These are just some of the replica guns and weapons seized from teens by the Vancouver police in recent weeks in what they are calling a disturbing uptick in violence. It includes two attacks in the Caresdale neighborhood where more than a dozen teens assaulted other youths at knife point. In another instance, a boy was lured to Stanley Park and beaten by a group of teens. And this CCTV video shows a pellet gun being held to a boy's head before a fight breaks out. We're really trying to get a, a big picture handle on how big this problem is. It's something that we started to see building uh, throughout the pandemic. In Victoria, police are reporting groups of more than 100 youth gathering downtown, damaging property and committing assaults. Many of the youth are telling us that after COVID, there's really not a lot of things for youth to do. Uh, so this uh, for them is an outlet. But experts say it's more complicated than that. We're seeing a lot of mental illness too, so aggression is, you know, part of that package. And it's those concerns that fueled an anti-bullying rally this weekend in Surrey, a show of support for victims left dealing with the scars of these crimes. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, with countries like Barbados and potentially Jamaica moving to cut ties with the monarchy, we wanted to know what would it take for that to happen in Canada? If the Queen's role in Canada is sort of baked into the constitutional framework of this country, how hard would it be to change that part of it? In the Canadian context, it's actually quite difficult. Now, we'll explain why it would be really hard to sever ties next.
Welcome back. During the last royal tour, an awkward moment for Will and Kate when Jamaica signaled its plans to follow Barbados and abolish the monarchy. Now, with Charles and Camilla in Canada, the question of whether to sever ties is once again being raised here. And it appears a growing number of Canadians are on board. A recent poll by the Angus Reid Institute found 51% of people think Canada should not continue as a constitutional monarchy for generations to come. That's up from 38% in 2016. Now, opinion polls are one thing, but actually doing it is another. So we set out to find out just how hard it would be for Canada to ditch the monarchy. When you think about it, she's kind of everywhere, right? Certainly on our coins, on our bills, on stamps, statues, highways, holidays. The Queen's influence is everywhere. But whenever a fight breaks out over whether we should keep the Queen or just move on, one thing that both sides often miss is that no matter how the debate goes, it is nearly impossible to cut ties with the monarchy. Now, when we started looking into this, one thing that very quickly became super obvious was just how big of a task we're talking about here. See, Canada's federal political system is made up of three parts. You have the judiciary, which is the courts, you know, right up to the Supreme Court of Canada. You have the legislative, which is Parliament, House of Commons, and the Senate. And then you have the executive, which is the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office and cabinet. All three work under the monarch, currently the queen. Abolishing the monarchy would mean chopping off the head. We go now to Parliament Hill for the ceremony of installation. Do swear that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty. Queen Elizabeth II. Queen of Canada. Her heirs and successors. I do. I do. I do. I do. So a constitutional monarchy is a system where you have a head of state who is uh, a monarch, so a royal person, and their power is very limited. Oh, by the way, this is Philippe Lagasse. Phil, you can wave hello. Uh, he's a professor at Carleton University, also an expert on that, I guess, intersection, that juicy intersection point between the crown and government and where power really lies. So if the queen's role in Canada is sort of baked into the constitutional framework of this country. How hard would it be to change that part of it? In the Canadian context, it's actually quite difficult. We have baked it in in the hardest amending formula in our constitutional framework, which means you would need to get all the provinces and the federal parliament to agree. In all likelihood, if you want Canada to become a republic, you should try and go to the United Kingdom and convince them to become a republic. Okay, so this is the point where I got a little bit confused because we have seen countries with ties to the monarchy cut those ties before, right? Less than a year ago, Barbados shed the queen as its head of state, completely transforming from a constitutional monarchy like Canada into a republic like the United States. The British monarchy has fallen like a leaf in autumn in Barbados. Take a look at this. The Constitution of Barbados, which I pulled up on my phone as a PDF, they've completely stripped out all references to Her Majesty, to the Crown, even the word sovereign. They've replaced the Governor General with an elected president, and they've shifted all power and property from the Crown to the state. So how'd they do that? Ultimately, what it came down to was that the bar in Barbados is so much lower than it is in Canada to affect this kind of a constitutional change. All they needed was a two-thirds majority in Parliament, and then, presto, it's done. So, in Canada, it would be very difficult to unplug from the monarchy in a wholesale way, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a gradual, very deliberate chipping away at the crown. I affirm, I affirm that I will be faithful, that I will be faithful and, bear and bear true allegiance, true allegiance to, Her Majesty, to Her Majesty 
Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II. For example, and many of you watching will know this firsthand, to become a Canadian citizen, you need to swear an oath of allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, which, if you came here from a completely different part of the world, you might see as really strange, even offensive. In 2014, three longtime permanent residents did not want to pledge allegiance to the monarchy, and they took their case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Dror Barnatan was one of those three people. And that was the part we fought against. I find the idea that one person is born with privileges relative to another, and that these privileges are state-sanctioned and hereditary and supposedly last forever. I mean, I found this idea repulsive. <laughs> but the verdict, none whatsoever. The Supreme Court wouldn't even hear the case. The lower court ruling was upheld, which was essentially that the oath is foundational to this country's system of government. And until that changes, it's just part of being Canadian. Unless you just grit your teeth, you take the oath, and then you take it back. That's called disavowing. It's completely symbolic. The whole thing is, of course, symbolic. But I wanted to have my symbols right. Now, none of this really approaches the question of abolishing the monarchy altogether. And, and keep in mind, for a lot of people, that's more than OK. Because this was the point at which I started wondering, is it even a good idea to cut ties with the Queen? Yes, there are all kinds of passionate arguments about cost, about independence, about colonial history. But it may surprise you to know that for many Indigenous communities in this country, there is a real weight between that relationship, between them and the Crown. Now, Delia Opikiku, hello. Hello. You are a Cree lawyer. You're also yeah. from the Canoe Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan. Yes, I am. And, and you've spent a huge portion of your life devoted to treaty rights. That's correct. In this country. So, so can I ask you, why would it matter if Canada were to abolish the monarchy? It matters, especially to elders, because the uh, crown and right of Great Britain was the original signatory to many of the treaties. And so for many elders, it means that the crown and right of Great Britain acted as a protector. Now, is that still important today in a legal sense? It's more symbolic now because Canada took over the protection of treaty and Aboriginal rights under the uh, 1982 Constitution. And the provinces also, according to the courts, have responsibility to implement and enforce the treaties. Right. And so I guess I'm wondering how much that symbolism really matters. I think the symbolism was very important under uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth. I don't know if that's going to follow through with Prince Charles. So where does that all leave us? Well, given how entrenched the monarchy is and how much political will would be required from everyone to change this country's system of government, chances are it's here to stay. But the Queen once said, I have to be seen to be believed, meaning the surest way to abolish the monarchy may simply be through indifference. And so not to put too fine a point on it, not impossible, mm -hmm. but quite a tall order when you're talking about a federation of provinces and territories, all of which who are free to make up their own minds on an issue as polarizing as this. Presuming the will is even there. Exactly. All right, coming up after the break, it was a residential school considered Canada's Alcatraz. One of the first calls I made to Penelicut was to a former chief, Jill Harris. Uh, and she told me a story that, that literally made the hairs on my neck stand up. In a new podcast, survivors share the haunting stories tied to the Cooper Island Residential School. Welcome back. For 85 years, Indigenous children were torn away from their families and sent to BC's Cooper Island Residential School. And for just as long, there were stories of those same children trying to escape and then dying. 
Built on what is now Penelicut Island, it was known as Canada's Alcatraz. Now, through a new CBC podcast, investigative reporter Duncan McHugh unravels some of what happened there. A Canadian Indigenous group says it found the unmarked graves of more than 700 people. Another disturbing discovery has been made near the site of a former residential school in British Columbia. They have documented evidence there that 121 children died at Cooper Island. I remember hearing the news just thinking to myself, finally, people will listen to what survivors have been saying for a really long time. And I just remember thinking, this is going to bring up a lot of pain. There isn't an Indigenous person in this country who hasn't been impacted by residential schools. For me, it's not speaking in Anishinaabim one. That's the hole in my heart. I'm Duncan McHugh. I'm from the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. I've been a reporter for a really long time in British Columbia and reporting on residential schools. And I'd heard a lot of really bad things about Cooper Island. It had a reputation. This is a school that in the first 30 years of its existence, uh, nearly 40% of the children died. Four out of 10 of the children that were going to the school died. There were children running away from Cooper Island throughout its 85 year existence. And that's nothing new. Children ran away from residential schools right across the country. But it's on an island in the Salish Sea and children were still trying to get away from the place, hopping on logs or stealing boats, and in some cases dying. And I just knew that more people needed to hear about this history. One of the first calls I made to Penelicut was to a former chief, Jill Harris. Uh, and she told me a story that, that literally made the hairs on my neck stand up. There were like appearances, children looking in their windows, the windows of the houses, some like hollering, and um, there was also some laughter. Jill told me that not long after the, the school was torn down, community members started sensing and hearing the spirits of children. They complained about children who were crying, who were touching them on their shoulders. When we started to make more calls, we discovered that was just the tip of the iceberg of, of, of the, the kinds of impacts that, that have been going on in this community. Coffee Hi. delivery. <laughs> Come on in. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Good. This is where they put some of the babies underground. They were buried here under the tree. And that's what he told me, you know. All the atrocities, the, the hurt, the sorrows that was in this ground, eh? These lands all hold a lot of pain right now. They hold a lot of bad memories. Some of the perpetrators of the abuses at the school were named. And that this wasn't an institution or a church. These were people that, that committed some of these crimes. And so we felt like it was important. To, to try to track some of them down. And so we did speak with, with one man who was guilty of multiple sexual abuses. That was a difficult conversation. I'll say it was frustrating, actually. When I had sat with survivors and realized that they still wake up in the middle of the night with, having nightmares about what happened to them. The community of Penelicut has been doing ground penetrating radar work for eight years now. This work is not going to be solved this summer. It's going to take years and it's going to cost money. That I think is, is what Canadians need to realize is that the children were mistreated in life, but they were also mistreated in death. And the communities need to make things right now. Cooper Island is an eight-part podcast series that tells the story of three people who survived the Cooper Island Residential School and one who did not. You can find it on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. So support is available for anyone affected by residential schools. You can access emotional and crisis referral services 
by calling the 24-hour National Crisis Line. The number is 1-866-925-4419. And next on The National, the effect of cases of norovirus on the B.C. oyster industry. We investigate why it's showing up in our shellfish. Stay with us. The reputation of B.C.'s oyster industry is being spoiled by illness. It's not the first time this has happened. And as Kurt Petrovich explains, some say it is likely not the last. They are synonymous with living well, and the draw is to eat them raw. Oysters, I've found in running this place, really do transcend uh, class, they transcend race, they transcend age. But Sean Chesney says for several months, customers stayed away, scared off by recalls of oysters contaminated with norovirus. The tainted shellfish were traced to just 14 growing sites out of about 500 in BC, but the tide of bad publicity hit an industry already hit hard by the pandemic. It sits with the importers and, and governments and um, the food safety officials of other governments um, and other countries for much longer than it would with the consumer. Finding and eliminating the culprit is a lot harder than it sounds. It can take as few as just 10 particles of norovirus to make you sick, but there can be up to 10 billion particles of norovirus in just one gram of human waste, about the size of a quarter teaspoon. Test results for norovirus can take weeks, which is why oysters aren't screened for it before shipping. Instead, no less than three government departments oversee a raft of regulations to test the waters oysters are grown in and to prevent sewage contamination. Shellfish farms have been closed as a There's result. There's been an outbreak every year since 2016, except during the pandemic. Four years ago, the cause was likely commercial fishermen illegally dumping onboard waste, according to the BC Centers for Disease Control. We're not happy about this occurring again, and really we'd like to see more measures put in place to prevent norovirus getting into marine waters in the first place. The Industry Association suggests scrutinizing more boats for compliance. Last year, in American waters adjacent to BC, the U.S. Coast Guard inspected more than 3,000 vessels of all types looking for sewage problems. Transport Canada conducted about 100 inspections of fishing vessels in all Canadian waters. A lot of regulations, not a lot of enforcers. But the cause may not be boats. Coastal housing and industry is pushing closer to BC's oyster farms. So we start talking about leaky septic systems and stuff like that. Who's going to go check somebody's system? When the tide goes out, you see the investigators say it could be several months the before the cause of this latest outbreak is identified, and they believe another one is inevitable. Kurt Petrovich, CBC News, Fanny Bay, British Columbia. Well, Edmonton and Calgary go head to head tonight, and so do their mayors. Our offices collaborated on coming up with a bet that would be engaging for all Albertans. The friendly rivalry over the Battle of Alberta is our moment after the break. Well, the Calgary Flames and Edmonton Oilers face off tonight in the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Battle of Alberta in the postseason for the first time in 31 years. Anxiety, excitement, tension, all high. And for some, the stakes are right up there. That's especially true for the mayors of Edmonton and Calgary, who have placed a rather sizable bet on the series. It's our moment. Calgarians are so excited that the Battle of Alberta is on. Our offices collaborated on coming up with a bet that would be engaging for all Albertans. We managed to get a little bit of Seinfeld isms in there. David Putty showed up with a big face paint of the New Jersey Devils because that was his team. So, what do you think? What is that? I painted my face. So, I said to Mayor Sohi, let's make sure the losing mayor has to wear full face paint of the opposing team. And he said, bring it on. Go, Oilers, go. But here's the best part. Each council will donate money to the other city's Kids Cancer Care Association. Please show your support for Ben Stelter. We have a local hero here, uh, Ben uh, uh, Stelter, uh, who has been, uh, you know, really showing resiliency to the community. So all council is embracing this and uh, Edmontonians are embracing this. 
Oilers, Oilers are going to win this game. Absolutely, Oilers all the way. It's going to be Calgary all the way. Go Flames, go. <laughs> Huge props for putting it towards a good cause, but I will say, I don't think I could put my face on the line. Oh, that way. That, sure you could. You don't know who's going to win. Sure you Who could. Knows? Listen, we're not in the business of favorites or predictions, <laughs> just facts. Uh, Battle of Alberta, Edmonton has the better record. There's your challenge, mm. Calgary. That is a national for May the 18th. Good night. Good night.